Hello and welcome back to You Want to Do What with Dan and Julie. Today we've got Johnny on who is a butcher. Hello, how are you? Happy days, yeah, good, thank you. So do you want to tell us a little bit about what you do, Johnny? Um, so, sorry, my cat's... Um, so, yeah, um, I'm a butcher. I've been a butcher for maybe six or seven years. Um, I'm currently in, uh, back in the UK, but I actually started my butchering career in Shanghai, China. Wow. Um, and I've had um, to date an amazing, uh, opportunity, opportunistic career. To be honest with you, it's been a, been a lot of fun. How did you end up in Shanghai and and deciding to learn butchery? Did you know? What? So initially, I was a um, audio engineer. I um, mastered a, well. I, I passed my uh, graduated from uni doing a, an audio degree, um, and I was in. Um, Beijing working for a computer game company um, and I was writing music and sound effects for them right. um, yeah it was, it was awesome like um, it was a lot of fun um, my day job was literally sat there recreating a, um, a futuristic pistol or, or like a cannon wow wow that's really cool oh, so much fun um, yeah so I was doing that for for quite a few years yeah. um, and then to be honest it, it it was such a cool thing, but then it, it got became my job and I didn't enjoy it as much. <laughs> yeah, that's mm. fair enough. Um, and then I started, um, I was co-running a, a bar uh, in Beijing. So I'd work my day job and then I'd go and uh, run this bar and uh, they wanted food. So then uh, I started cooking um, at this bar and it's something that twigged in me. I, I mean, like even at uni, I was working as a, working as a chef, but then something twigged and I was like, you know what? The, I needed career change, mm. um, and then it was my, my girlfriend, now my wife. She had a, an opportunity in Shanghai, so we moved there, and I couldn't find audio work anywhere. Um, it was really difficult to get a job, and I walked past a butcher shop, and it was a really really cool butcher shop called um, Yasmin's, and um, it was like a Western style butcher shop. Anyway, they were hiring, so I went in. And I was like, I've got no idea of what, what it is. I don't know. I don't really know much. Um, yeah. And then I got the job. <laughs> <laughs> and it was basically because they wanted uh, a Westerner behind the counter. Right. Okay. Um, so I got the job. And I remember, like, basically, they didn't want to teach me anything. They were like, no, you just stand there uh, <laughs> and smile. And it was like, ah, I'm a butcher. Well, I'm, I'm, I've got the, the, the title of a butcher, but I've not touched anything. I don't do anything. Mm. So... I started studying myself and, and teaching myself how to um, how to, to use a knife on, on different cuts of meat. Um, I remember especially like one customer, an American customer, ordered short ribs, and um, they sent me something in which was just which wasn't short ribs. And I remember trying to sell it to them like, yeah, yeah short ribs. That's what I ordered. <laughs> and this dude was like mate you need to do some homework and then I, I went home that night and it was like oh my god what was I doing <laughs> <laughs> cringeworthy but um but yeah so I was with them for a little bit and then um I ended up quitting because oh the scariest thing happened so well a couple of things happened like one time was um they were brining um turkeys to make turkey turkey um sliced turkey yeah and we were using um Salt Petra, um, basically they're using the nitrates, but it is in a pure form. And they were p- pouring like a kilogram of this this powder that will kill you into a into a vat and pouring these um, turkey turkey breasts in. Oh, and I remember like thinking like you're going to kill someone oh, at some yeah. point. And it was like at that point, it's like you know what? Uh, I'm probably not <laughs> yeah, I'll but, walk away before the lawsuit comes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that that was me done. Um, but you kept on with so butchery I, after that. Well, so this is it. So um, it, it kind of like something something sparked inside me, and I was like, "This is this is interesting to me." Um, so I left that, and then obviously had to. Me and my my missus were, well, she was working, and I had to get some kind of income. So I started making pork scratchings in our flat. Um, you love pork scratchings, don't you? I yours? do. They are a go-to for me after <laughs> a round of golf or something. They were just phenomenal, mate. Like I was, so I would go. I get up at like four o'clock in the morning, and I go to the local butchers. And uh, and buy it from them in like mass quantities, and then I'd prepare it in this tiny little flat we were living in, um, and um, and then yeah, and then I'd go around all the bars to expats and things like that, and I'd sell them there. Yeah. And that's where Butcher Farrell started, actually. That's where, that was the uh, the wow. brand. Um, yeah, so that was really cool. 
Um, so what, what did you, how long did it take you to get from sort of where you were, where you started to actually being able to break down, uh, you know, a carcass? Um, see, this is the thing, right? So, so I, I left Shanghai and we moved to Hong Kong and um, where I did a couple of jobs, um, jobs as a chef. Mm. And, and then I just from basically talk, Hong Kong is an amazing place where you can, you meet people so much, so much easier. Um, and you word spread so, so quickly. Um, anyway, so it just happened that I met someone and that introduced me to somebody else. And then before I knew it, I was a head butcher of a really, really cool, um, butcher shop, uh, in Hong Kong. And it was like, right you know uh, uh i've really got to do my homework so i, I basically just studied and studied and studied um and i taught myself how to break down um just everything how, how so, did you study what was it uh, online it, youtube or, or bit of youtube uh, and there's an amazing guy called adam danforth um he, he's like an american chap who's got two books uh, i think he's got a couple actually but well, two that i've got um and they're just phenomenal they teach you uh, a blow by blow like how to do it mm. um and i just remember just i basically just memorized that and then um just set to and then once you once you kind of get an idea um you can apply to it i mean i'm still like you, the beauty about butchering is there's always something to learn there always is it's phenomenal mm. um and um so yeah I remember this, this might sound like a bit of a silly question, but the goal of be, being a butcher or butchery is to get the most out of an animal and the, the best cuts. And, and the, is that sort of the goal of the whole industry? Depends on who you talk to, mate. Like for me, yeah, that's it. It, it, it fundamentally is like the meat industry has a huge crisis on at the moment. Um, and for me, it is you you get the carcass and you use as much as you can possibly can like my house at the moment unfortunately you can't smell it but it, it just smells of chicken soup because i, I <laughs> broke down some chickens at work yesterday and i brought the carcasses home and i'm i've just been making that soup all day yeah and um, and that's what it's about you know like i do the same with um with beef bones um i'll bring that back um my freeze is full of bits and pieces that I've, i'll bring back because i refuse to throw it away but that's the, the, for me, that's the ethos is like you get an animal and you, you use the animal, you know? Do you, do you find that people like chefs, for example, will want to come to people like you because they know, they know that you're going to use the best produce and break it down the best way? And is that how the industry kind of works a bit? If you're lucky, yeah. Like, I mean, I mean, you get good, good and bad people from, from the industry and all kinds of things, but I've been really lucky with some of the chefs I've worked with and it's really inspiring. Like you get two like-minded heads together and you can come up with some phenomenal stuff. Like when I was in Hong Kong, um, I was head butcher for, well, I was group butcher for an awesome group called uh, Maximal Concepts and they, they're just phenomenal. They're great ethos behind them. And I was working with their um, executive chef. Uh, he's left there now. It's Edgar. And then me and him like got together, put our heads together and was like, right, well, we're going to have loads of fat left over. So we ended up doing the edible candle. So you, you'd melt it down into a whole, whole candle size, that, um, whole candle. And you take it to the table, light it, and it would be melting this beautifully dry aged fat. And you just dip the bread in with a bit of salt. Oh my oh, word. That sounds crazy. amazing. <laughs> yeah. And, and it, it, the, the fat that I was using was um, off a of Ruby Galega, which is this type of um, beef from Spain. In England, we call it Galician Blonde. Right. Um, and it has this really like unique flavor to it. It's kind of almost like um, gamey. Um, it's, it's just been, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, so yes, yeah, so then we did that. We would make, um, with all of the bones, we'd make stock and that stock would be used across the board. We'd even deep fry stuff in fat, actually. We'd render it down as, as beef tallow and then we'd use that to, you know, if we don't put it in candles, we'd be using it for, for frying empanadas in and the, the meat inside the empanadas were always like off cuts and bits and pieces so we, we used everything wow you're actually talking my language this sounds fantastic <laughs> um, so what what is exciting you at the moment about butchery uh, whether that be in the uk or worldwide um what is something that sort of gets you up in the morning you're like yes this is this is what i want to do um to be honest with you there's a whole new um there's a whole new generation coming through um you, even like younger than me, like uh, that are coming through, that are excited, and um, and some of the people that are doing stuff with 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 me is just 
just out of this world and you see some 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 products that they're making and it's just like wow how on earth have you done that i don't know and um, and it's just like there's a whole passion to it again and i think the thing is with butchery is it, it, it was stagnant a few years ago um and um and now it's just kind of finding itself like for instance you've got i'm a, I'm a member of um, team great britain so i'm, I'm going to be butchering for for the country um it was meant to be in sacramento this september but obviously covid um covid destroyed that idea mm-hmm. um and but so so yeah so there's 18 countries and we all get together and we compete against each other and you basically have to produce products from uh, an assorted amount like amount of um of meat that are innovative you're using everything um and it's just when you see some of these, these some of these really cool butchers it's just phenomenal and it's like it's something that it's an art, isn't it? It's, you know, yeah, you know, it is, it is. Well, if you can appreciate, you know, seeing what someone does with a knife, it's actually, you know, incredible. Whether yeah, they definitely. It. Yeah. yeah, and then you're creating products from something that, that normally would just be just, you're just showing respect to, to what, where it comes from, you know? Mm. Yeah, I think that's a really important point, actually, you know, showing uh, there's a lot of movement of, you know, vegans and vegetarians and, I think people that eat meat as well are starting to think about, you know, how, how much they eat meat a week and, uh, and showing, you know, they're using all the animal, not just wasting stuff. So, so this is a massive thing and I've never, I'll never knock a vegan um, or a vegetarian or anything like that. If that's what the way you want to do it, happy days. And if you've got your, your, um, your ethos behind that, I'm really, I'm, I'm really happy and I'm proud of you. Well done for, for making that decision. Yeah. Um, cutting meat out hundred percent, it probably let's face it it probably will happen at some point i don't think it'll happen through our lifetime or even our children's lifetime but it, it, it it's going to happen so you're right it's it's how to um how to address that and i think showing respect to the animal um where the animal comes from how it's been how it's bred um how it's looked after is is a fundamental part of it um and a massive thing here in England, our um, agriculture is just phenomenal. You know, um, the amount that farmers do for the for the land um, with the animals is just is is unheard, unnotified. A lot of people don't know about it. You know, yeah. Um, and it, it's something that needs to have um, light shed on it as well. Um, it's it's just one of those. It's like people seem to think that they get sidetracked with it when they think about meat and the consumption of meat on a global scale. It's it's ridiculous. Um, for instance, yeah, you're talking about deforestation in Amazon for for cattle, um, which is true. Which it, it is happening. But you mentioned um, lowering meat consumption, and I think the world needs to take a a, a, a look at how we're doing things and uh, trying to use that as a as a uh, a blueprint yeah yeah, yeah certainly because I, I i read something the other day or saw something the other day about um using livestock to to manage the land or something to graze land and and take down brush um so you can let wildflowers grow and there's lots of stuff yeah. like that happening in the uk right huge stuff massively i mean this is the thing like it's um soil re- re- regenerative farming basically right. um and the, the soil locks in so much co2 um and from from livestock that, that that basically turns over like if you were to get rid of the meat industry completely um you would have no topsoil we, we would just be completely i mean topsoil we need topsoil earth for a reason is coiled earth do you know what i mean yeah, it's, yeah. it's cool um so i mean there's loads of things it, it's funny I'm, I'm doing a master's in food science and oh, wow uh, yeah and the module i'm doing right now is um food future sustainability and literally just before i got onto you guys tonight i just opened up my uni page and one of the guys on there is mouthing off about the meat industry uh, so after i finish you guys i'm gonna to have to write up a report and mouth <laughs> <laughs> you know uh, recently we've actually spoken to a few people in hospitality uh, they're actually slightly more towards like the uh, the drink side of things one of the things that actually came out of the conversations with them is they're actually seeing a lot more people uh, particularly the younger generations have like more of a a respect for uh, the things that they're eating and being a bit more adventurous in the fact that these days people aren't eating stuff for the sake of it. They're actually looking at the quality and uh, the diversity of what they can have. Do you see that over the maybe past couple of years or anything that you're getting more 
diverse produce in and more people are looking for that more diverse and really really looking for the quality stuff yeah definitely like i think it's to do with um I think it's to do with it, like technology, basically. Technology, you, every generation Z kid out there has has been brought up with a phone. Um, if you ask a question, and I mean, I do it now. If somebody asks me a question, I'll get Google out and I'll Google it and I've got the answer for you within seconds, you know? And I think because of that, it's so easy to get an answer about stuff and to, to be influenced with an opinion. Um, and I think Gen Zers, and to an extent millennials as well, um, we we kind of look into to what's going on and are taking note of it a bit more. Um, and I think it is, it's like people are conscious about what what's happening to the world. For instance, when I'm at work, right, when I'm, when I'm at the counter, most of the, the younger um, customers of mine, you ask them if they need a bag, they're like, no, no, don't worry about it. And they will carry my the, the, the meat out by hand. Whereas like a lot of the older generations, they can literally buy one lamb chop, which I wrap up in paper, waxed paper. And instead of giving them, they'll be like, they'll ask for a bag. Do you know? <laughs> yeah. It's like... And they've really? probably already got a bag on them as well. Yeah, no, well, this is it. And it's like, do you, need, do you need a bag? Yeah, please. And they probably collect them and it's like... But yeah, it, it, it's something I think that, that, that the younger generation like um, certainly could like... Um, they're certainly looking into it and they're aware of of what's happening and you know, they have to be, they really have to be. So what would be uh, an average day for a butcher? What sort of things do you get up to day by day? Uh, It's like groundhog day, mate. (laughs) I love what I do, but I mean, um, well, so yeah, so you get up, it's for me, it's a seven 30 start. Um, and already, so I'm off on Monday, Tuesdays and my day, that's my weekend. Um, and I already know, um, that, so for instance, I had loads of chicken coming on Friday, not everything sold. So first the job is my chicken job, breaking that down into smaller pieces. And then it goes to whatever. Sometimes I'll, I'll send it to other restaurants, uh, customers will come in and buy bits and pieces, whatever. And, and then you, you just basically, you're always prepping for the weekend and for orders and whatnot. So that's, that's, that's generally every single day. So you get up. Wednesdays, I start breaking down some beef um, to ready. Either if either I'll break it down so it's easy to manage on a weekend. If anybody comes in asking for something, it's a smaller thing for me to cope with. Or I'll just literally break it completely down to, and then I'll backpack it, and then it's ready as, as it is then. But that's essentially what you do. You, you, you're working through to the weekend, really. And what kind of... Uh, so we've mentioned you go off to maybe some competitions and things do you go to farms do you look for places that produce really great produce or are you in the shop you know all the time see this is the trouble like um um for me my, the shop I'm in is like it's a really small shop we're, we're a really small outfit and I don't get time to do anything like that on the flip side I'm really lucky because most of the meat I get is from our own farm uh, the owner has their family have, have been farming for generations. And um, so I get the meat from them. So it, it's been, I, I visited them when I first came and went to, to look around and whatnot. And it's, it's really nice. It's all, um, it's all organic. We don't have the certification because that's something you've got to pay for. It's a, a whole dot on the I's and crossing the T's thing. Right. And, but essentially they, they're just like eating grass. Um, and it's really nice beef. We do really nice lamb as well. Um, the pork I get locally. Um, and then I get free range chicken over from Huddersfield um, from a really, really reputable company. Um, I'd love to be able to do more more farm visits, though, definitely. Mm. And what about um, do any uh, do you visit any of the restaurants, local restaurants, and give advice on your cuts and things like that? Yeah, again, like um, so the restaurants are the, the, in the owner's company basically. So um, I deal I deal with the chefs there, um, and they're really cool. I'd say like. Um, the for instance if i've got a, um something that i've got a, 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 a lot of uh send them a message and say look i've got some brazen steak and then they'll be like they'll, they'll change their menus accordingly so it is it's a question of if i've built something up and i've got an excess of then they will use and it's it's a, it's a good circle it's a good cycle good. Yeah. yeah what what type of personality would somebody need for this job you know you've mentioned uh, i'd imagine you have to be quite patient to be able to break down a whole <laughs> you know, carcass and um, you need well, to be good to, you know, with people and 
what kind of uh, things do you need to have? It depends on what kind of butcher you want to be as well. I mean, like, so I'm a, I'm a very people person. I like to, to be in front, of an, um, in front of my customers and I'll talk to them. Um, and then you get some butcher, butchers who are, who are like, um, they're more of, um, they'll, they'll be sit, sit behind the, uh, the counter and they're just, they'll just churn out whatever they need to there and then. Um, kind of person though is you, you, you've got to, I mean, it's hard, you know, I work 10 hours a day. Um, I don't really get a break. Um, and if it, it takes me about four hours to eat my lunch, cause I'm literally just like one bite here, right? I'll go and do some work. I'll have a bite there, you know? Um, you got to be, it, it's still a, an old industry. So you get the mick taken out of a hell of a lot. Certainly I do, especially if I'm taking a photo for my Instagram. <laughs> uh, there's words I can't say online. <laughs> that I'm described, you know, yeah, um, yeah. but I get that from the old timer. He's just, he thinks I'm an idiot. Uh, <laughs> but then again, you know, that, that's just highlights the, the, the two different generations and, and like, my generation of butchers are interested. They will take a picture of what they've done because they're proud of what they've done. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, you know? Um, so what are some of the, uh, the positives that you find in the industry and some of the opportunities you can, uh, you can take, get out of it? Um, for me, like it, it was always a, um, you're using something that's raw right from the prime. You're, you're using something that is, you can sculpt into something and that somebody will enjoy, somebody will take pleasure in, um, be it the end consumer, sorry, that's my email, be it the end consumer or be it the um, chef who will then take it on and to, to produce something even more prettier than, than what you've done. Um, so you make a, a direct influence from that. Um, for me, I get my kicks out of my customers um, and turning my customers on to, to different cuts Um and then you can get them excited. Like, for instance, fillet. I absolutely hate fillet. I think it's a rubbish piece of meat. There's two uh, muscles per, per body, per, mm. per carcass. Um, the muscle doesn't do anything. It's called the psoas major and the psoas minor. Mm-hmm. It doesn't do anything, right? Um, that's why it's so tender. But it doesn't have that much flavor. And it's also crazy expensive. It's £45 yeah. pounds per kilo, where I am. Um, so yeah, I'm more of a rum guy, to be honest. Well, yeah, because rum's tasty, right? Yeah, it's got, um, it's got more to it. Yeah, it's got a bit of a bite to it. It's got personality. Um, but then, so like, my customers will come in and they'll be like, oh, I really want some fillet because I'm going to have a stir fry tonight. And you're like, what? <laughs> Seriously? And they're like, yeah, well, because my, my, little, my little boy doesn't really like to chew. And like, oh, my God. And then you're like, right, well, look, here's a flat iron. Slice this up for you. Uh, yeah. It's 15 quid per kilo. Save yourself some money. Go and buy me a pint later. You what know is what it? It is a, so I suppose um, you obviously said that you've worked as a chef, but I, I know, you know, if I go into a butcher's and I pick something out, they will generally tell me the best way to cook it. Is that, you know, is that generally something across the board? Uh, <laughs> it depends. <laughs> the guy I work with, is, is, um, he's, he, he starts talking about um, how to cook stuff. And um, and it's like, dude, I've just heard you talk about how you, you, tin ravioli is the nicest thing you've ever eaten in your life. <laughs> And you're like, the, the customer will come up and it's like, I might probably wouldn't listen to him. Here's how you want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but that being said, though, I mean, a lot of the butchers kind of, yeah, they, they, they do. You've got to have an understanding of where the muscle comes from because every single muscle cooks differently to, to the other. So you've got to understand that. Yeah. Uh, as a general rule, um, if it works harder, then it takes longer to cook. Yeah. Okay. That's, That's the easy way of doing it. So what are some maybe less favourable parts of the industry that you have to deal with? Um, that's a hard question, actually. Customers again. You know? <laughs> customers again. <laughs> it's like a double-edged sword. Um, yeah. You get some nightmares of customers. Um, and that expression, customers always right. Mm. I don't. Um, and then quite a lot of time I have to bite my tongue and uh, just reel it in and let them just let it go over my back. Um Again, you know, I'm really lucky. Um, I'm in a, a small place where I have my regulars. Um, we make decent money um, and we use our own produce. I certainly think that if I was in a bigger environment um, using lesser quality um, meat, I can imagine that would be, it would, I think that would draw, it would, it would cut really thin that I wouldn't enjoy that. Um, 
like you're saying, like uh, everyone likes a piece of meat for the the the, the food, um, and then some people can't afford higher welfare animals, which I understand, you know. Um, but then again, some of the lower welfare animals and how they're tra- they're treated, it's just that's that's part of the industry that needs to be cut out, you know. But it, then again, like it's you've got to be so careful because that's somebody's livelihood there, you know. Some yeah. of these, but some of these farmers have been farming for again generations. Fair enough, it's not part of what we consider um, high welfare, but that's their livelihood. You can't just cut somebody's livelihood just because it, you consider it wrong. Yeah. yeah do you get um much act, like uh people um protesting yeah protesting and and uh, yeah disputing yeah um not not in this place when i was at jimmy's farm um before i moved up north again um yeah i had quite a few people he he went on on bbc once um when i was set, when i was there and he um said something that that riled up a bunch of vegan activists and um and yeah, like a, I remember it was Easter Sunday and we had a police guard at the farm. No way. Yeah. And they were just, um, they would have um, V Vendetta, v for, I can't speak, V for Vendetta masks, which I find is just the most inappropriate thing. Like if you're going to dispute something, then then show your face and let's talk yeah, about it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah uh, a lot. Yeah. You you always get people on the extremes of whatever point of view on both sides. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. And it's just it, it doesn't help their, anyone. Their voice is the one that's generally heard loudest as well. Yeah, it's exactly. True. Yeah, it's tough. Um, it's tough. And like the thing is, it's the majority of their points are hundred percent correct. You know, yeah. The points is like yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I've, I've you know I've had fights with them in the past, and they're like they'll they'll be spurting out all of their um their kind of uh, their info, and it's like yeah. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, well, how can you still do it? And it's like, because of X, Y, and Z. And then you, you have a conversation, but they, they, they won't listen to that. No. Nah. Um, but that's, that's yeah, when I was there, I had quite a bit. And I had, I've had some on my Instagram a bit as well. Luckily, I'm generally okay. Because on my Instagram, I like to be, um, I, I don't like to force my opinions too much. So I'll just put up a piece of meat and I'll be like, this is a really nice piece of meat. Um, and I try to be, I don't try to be too in your face. So I think I've, I've looked out a little bit and I don't get too much, but now and again, I'll get some, someone that's just literally, you're a monster. <laughs> but having spoken to you, you know, you are, you care about the welfare of the animals and you care about, you know, using all the produce. Like you said, you brought home those chickens, you're making chicken soup, like you're not wasting anything. And if we have to eat meat, which at the moment, okay, we don't have to, but it's a big part of people's lives still, then doing it the way you're doing it is probably the best way to do it. Yeah, definitely. So, so I, I can't remember the numbers. Basically, I think we, as a nation, we exported eighty-five thousand tons of beef last year. Wow, that's a lot of of meat. But we in, imported one hundred sixty thousand tons of meat. One hundred sixty, um, yeah, one hundred sixty thousand tons of meat. Basically, double. Like it, it. For me, the maths doesn't work out. Like, why are we? Why are we shipping that out and we're bringing? Because it's people have like people just don't the, the eat meat eaters around us will be like, oh, I'll have a ribeye steak tonight. Why? Why have a ribeye steak? It's a Wednesday, do you know? Yeah. Why, you, you, I mean, I can't afford a ribeye steak every single night of the week. So if you're gonna have a ribeye steak, right? Treat yourself to it. Like you know, uh, yeah. you, you've yeah, got yeah. a promotion at work. Have that. If you, I, oh, sorry. Okay, sorry, carry on. Well, no, I was just gonna say if you do want some meat, right? Like, well have like i don't know there's there's different cuts there's like um a shoulder shoulder cloth from the shoulder um the triceps bracket it's a really nice piece of meat it's generally considered a brazen steak but i treat it a different way and you can just have that as a midweek steak you know you don't have to have a prime cut um, and i think that's what a lot of people just don't really understand and supermarkets certainly don't help because they don't offer the wide range yeah mm. um and that's where I think go. the fish industry is pretty similar in the fact that, you know, we go away to Spain or wherever on holiday. We're like, oh, this is, you know, fresh fish. We're out in the Mediterranean. It'd be brilliant. But it turns out most of it's caught off the coast of England. And then yeah, it's really tough. The fish industry, I don't know much about, but from what I've heard, it's in a lot of trouble. <laughs> it's the same as the meat industry. <laughs> um, we like to talk a little bit about money on the show. So we'll give you some average sort of income figures that we've researched for the industry and just sort of tell us if that sits right with uh, your experiences. Mm-hmm. 
So um, incomes can sort of range between 20 to 30,000 a year. That's, you know, very rough. That's an average split all up and down the country. Does that sort of sit right with you maybe? Yeah, pretty much. Like obviously if you're an apprentice, um, you're going to get less than that. Yeah. Um, and then um, you can go all the way up to, to, to higher than that, to be honest with you, depending on where you are um, and what you're bringing to the table. Um it's a weird one because butchery you don't have to necessarily have like a, a formal education for it. Um, you, you know, you don't go to university to become a butcher. Um, and certainly if you've got a degree, like I've got a degree, it doesn't influence your pay grade. Um, obviously certain other jobs in industries, if you go into it with a degree, um, despite your degree being something completely different, mm. it will, it will help towards your, your pay packet. Mm. Whereas butchering, you know, it doesn't really do anything. So if somebody is listening and they think, yeah, actually, I really want to get involved in this, what is the best route for somebody to get into butchery? There's a few th- few things you can do. There's um, the, the Meat Institute of Ipswich. Um, I can give you guys links later. Um, they're really, really cool. They, they deal with apprenticeships. Um, and then um, and the, 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 I think that's like a more of a formal route to take. Um find out where your local butcher is really um because there are some really cool places um dep- if you're in london it's even easier and um and you've just got to go for it go into a place and say look i'm, I'm really interested in learning and if they turn around and say like nah then they're not the right place for you anyway i know for a fact if you go to a lot of um, places that my friends own and if you go in and say look i'm really interested they would be like they'll snap you up like that um there aren't that many butchers out there for a start anyway. Um, and we need to bring people in um, that have got an interest. And yeah, they'll just be able to put you to the knife straight away and to, and to teach you through. That's good. So if there, there are opportunities out there, which is, uh, which is really good to hear. Um, what would be something that's uh, probably not on the job description that uh, you have to deal with every now and then? <laughs> that is a really tough question. Um, well, to be to be honest with you, again, like it, it, social media now plays a massive part of um, of the shop's way of life. Um, I mean, for my little shop, I kind of I just do my own and use it as my own butcher farrow brand. But I know certain other places um, that that's something that, that it's not necessarily you're not holding a knife, but it's vital for um, for the shop networking as well, like building a um, relationship with your customers. That's not necessarily part of being a butcher. Per se, it's not like your skill required, but it's something that you certainly need. Um, if you were to be a counter, um, a retail butcher, you need that, that that personality. And how would somebody really sort of progress in the industry? You've had a quite a, quite an amazing journey from where you started to where you are now. Um, how would you recommend somebody progresses themselves within the industry? So I'm at a, a really exciting. Um, I actually I handed in my uh, my resignation last week and I'm changing my my job. I, I didn't really tell you, um, and I can't really say too much just yet. But for me, it's the it's the natural progression for me. Okay. Um. So you okay? So you you become a butcher and you work really hard. You get your skill set, and then you um, there's there's a few different ways. You you can either own your own shop, um, which is a really really tough um, a tough thing to do. Um, you have to be confident that you've got the right location. Your staff is just, you, it's so key to the shop running um, smoothly. There's a really, really guy, a great guy called Simon Taylor, who's the captain of um, Team GB. And uh, he's he's just, he's worked really hard. And now he's just got to a position where he's buying a few other shops under his brand. Okay. Um, so he's obviously doing really, really well. Um and he's got the personality and the, the the image point to kind of like help that along. Um, so there's certainly owning your own place. Um, and then there's also um, working for a bigger company. You can move up the ranks there. You can work as a buyer. Um, for me, like a, my, since I started doing my master's, um, I loved getting into more of the commercial side. I've really interested, really been interested in learning about the commercial side of things. Um, so my next position is a little bit different. Um, I won't be on the knife as much as, a, as I am. Um, so I'll be taking a back foot. But it's something that's for me. It's I can't really talk about it just just yet because it's not. <laughs> don't worry, you don't you don't have to talk about it. Don't worry. But um, for me, it's a natural progression. It, it, yeah, it's 
but again that's the thing for, for me to get this job it's sort yeah. of a development um okay. my, my master's is um is a, is a huge huge part of that right okay and uh would you still go into the industry knowing uh what you know now yeah definitely um yeah definitely it, it's such an awesome industry like uh, and especially if you get into a shop where you've got a great um a great network in the shop of, of people that you, you can rely on you can learn from um it, it's such a weird thing like and as you said my, my career's been so far it's just been so different and i've learned so much and i was a sponge when i first started learning i was so lucky to be in a foreign country where i had um argentinian chefs for instance talking to me about a cut they wanted to have and and like i just had to produce it and i've got i had no idea when i would have to go back and do my research because if I didn't do it, then I just look like a fool. They know uh, their meat as well, don't they? The Argentinians. <laughs> absolutely so. This guy is kind of amazing. I loved working with him. Um, but I was so lucky in that. And a lot, I know a lot of my, uh, my, my peers didn't have that um, ability to do that. And I've always wished that they could do. Because England can be a very um, backward kind of wet thinking way. Like, so, for instance, the, the butchers that I got to now, um, some of the cuts of meat are brazen steak is brazen steak you can't do anything else with it but i told you before if you treat it a different way then it's a beautiful midweek steak um and i learned that from from another friend of mine that was an american guy and it's just like there's so much more information that you can learn that will help you kind of thing it's just yeah yeah it's it's a great industry so uh, where can people find you on uh, social media um, it, Butcher Farrell. I, I i i don't really use twitter i never got into it for some that's reason. fair enough yeah. um, we will but, we will link you uh, in our Instagram where we do a post. And thank you so much for coming on. It's been really, really interesting. Yeah, oh, really you. Do you know what? Just like, I really appreciate like what you guys do because when I was in school, there was nothing really like that for me, you know? And I was like checking out your page and there's so many other interesting um, discussions that, that I was like, what? I didn't, you know, I didn't really know that. Yeah. And like, like I said, when I was growing up, there was, there was nothing like that. I mean, that's why we've, we've got into it is because we – didn't know yeah I, I had no idea what i wanted to do in school and end up in an office job and yeah then, you so know that's that's why we're doing this so thank you so much for uh, for that well, and thank you for coming on to uh to spread your word on the on your uh, career i appreciate it thank you thanks johnny cheers thank you right so, uh, bye